All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live talk on knee injuries in athletes. Before we begin, we'd like to ask that you submit your questions via Zoom throughout the presentation. And once we conclude the presentation, I'll read these off to Dr. Bigger so he can answer them. Now I'd like to share a little bit about OrthoSouth. We offer comprehensive orthopedic care across seven clinic locations in the Mid-South region. We have surgery centers in both Germantown, Tennessee and South Haven, Mississippi, and are proud to share that our Germantown Surgery Center was recently ranked Newsweek Top ASC in America. We offer Saturday clinic hours in Bartlett, evening hours in East Memphis, and a 24-7 urgent care triage line for those after-after-hours injuries. Now to introduce our speaker. A native of Greenwood, Mississippi, Dr. Biggers attended Pillow Academy and went on to study at Mississippi State University where he earned his Bachelor of Science. Dr. Biggers then attended medical school at the University of Mississippi Medical Center where he earned his medical degree in 2009. Dr. Biggers completed a five-year orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Tennessee Campbell Clinic in 2014. Dr. Biggers then underwent additional year of training in sports medicine and arthroscopy at the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama. As a fellow, Dr. Biggers served as an associate physician for the University of Alabama, the Birmingham Barons, WWE, and the Birmingham Ballet. He also treated multiple professional and collegiate athletes from across the country. Dr. Biggers specializes in disorders of the shoulder, elbow, hip, and knee, as well as all sports-related injuries. He also has expertise in shoulder and knee replacement surgery. Dr. Biggers is a member of multiple academic societies, including the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, and the Arthroscopy Association of North America. Dr. Biggers has authored multiple publications, presentations, and educational conferences. We have him with us here today, so now I invite you to sit back and listen as Dr. Biggers shares his presentation on knee injuries and in athletes. Take it away, Dr. Biggers. All right. Well, thank you. And, uh, and thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, I hope this talk is uh, informative and, uh, and worth your time. Um, you know, really talking about knee injuries and in athletes, some common things I see in the office. And um, I think all this is kind of pertinent for you know, my athletes of uh, all ages of life. But um, just to get started, I want to touch on a little bit about the anatomy of the knee. And if you just look at the diagram here, you can you can see the bony anatomy. You see the thigh bone or the femur or the shin bone, the tibia. You got the fibula as well as the kneecap or patella. And those are the bones that were uh, that kind of make up the knee joint. And then you'll see the ligaments. So you've got the, the medial and the collateral ligaments. And then in the inside of the knee or the middle part of the knee, you have the cruciate ligaments, the anterior and posterior. And, and really, that's kind of the crux of what we're going to be talking about tonight is, is ligament injuries. That's typically um, more what I'm seeing in, in athletes, more so than fractures or arthritis and such. Um, now, now, this diagram that you're looking at now, it's a little bit oversimplified, and, and this is kind of a more realistic picture. You know, there's, um, it is a fairly complicated joint. There's more ligaments and, um, and tendons and muscles and whatnot that I just mentioned in that kind of um, easier to understand diagram. But um, I think there's some benefit for simplicity um, yeah, for teaching purposes. But, um, you yeah, know, with a knee injury, it's really no different than any musculoskeletal injury of the body. And a good starting point is to get a good history. You know, if we, um, if much of what we need to know to diagnose the injury can come from just talking to the patient. And so um, we want to know, you know, when the injury happened, is this a new injury or is it an old injury? Where's the pain and you know, what does it feel like things that make the pain better things that make the pain worse you know and after we get an adequate history we'll, we'll, um, we'll sit down and actually put our hands on the patient you know do an examination where we look at the knee and see if there's anything obviously out of place you know assess the range of motion see if there's any sort of stiffness that developed um, assess the strength you know any areas that may be tender to palpation can be um, helpful in, in knowing where the injury is and, as well as certain provocative tests so certain injuries have very specific tests that can help um, you know, uh, help us make the diagnosis as well. And then after we do an exam, many times we're getting some images. And, and first of all, uh, most of the time I'll get some x-rays. And, um, you know, many times those x-rays are normal, but um, you know, even though they're normal, they're helpful in providing a lot of information, you know, ruling out other injuries. But when we're talking about a ligament injury, we can't really see that on an x-ray. And so um, many times we end up getting an MRI to further evaluate the injury. And then once we have all the information, then we can come up with a treatment plan, um, whether it be anti-inflammatories and ice, rest, you know, some bracing, physical therapy, and occasionally even surgery. 
Um, so the different knee injuries I want to talk about tonight, um, an anterior cruciate ligament tear, medial collateral ligament tear, posterior cruciate ligament tear, a posterior lateral corner injury, which is kind of the outside of the knee, meniscus tears, as well as patella or kneecap dislocations. And we'll kind of start with the ACL tear. And many of us have uh, probably heard of the ACL tear or our favorite football player having an ACL tear and missing some time. But the, um, the ACL is this ligament that you can see in the picture here. And its job is to keep the shin bone from shifting forward on the thigh bone. And it helps uh, protect the knee and prevent injury to the cartilage and meniscus. And when it's torn, it doesn't do its job. And so it's a common injury, again, leading to the anterior and lateral instability of the knee. Um, over 400,000 ACL reconstructions are performed every year. So um, a lot of people are, are having this injury. And we actually see this more commonly in our female athletes. Um, and again, the treatment's typically surgical. Um, you know, the, uh, the history, a lot of times patients will come in and say they felt a pop in their knee and had some immediate pain. You know, over 70% of the time, the knee will be um, filled with blood. So they'll have a big swollen knee. Some of the more common sports that we see this in are soccer, basketball, as well as skiing and football. And a couple of different ways that the ACL can be torn. Sometimes it's uh, like the image up top of the basketball player where it's just a non-contact injury, kind of a pivoting or twisting injury to the knee. But you also can have uh, an injury like the bottom picture there where um, you have an athlete that takes a direct blow or impact to the outside part of the knee that can cause the injury. On exam, you see a big swollen knee. You know, lots of times it's stiff and painful. Um, patients will walk with an altered gait or a limp um, due to that. And then the provocative test that can um, kind of identify the ACL is that Lachman, where we're kind of moving the shin bone forward on the thigh bone, as well as something called a pivot shift test. On x-rays, we frequently do get these, again, but many times they are normal. Um, you know, we can sometimes see something called a Sagone fracture, which is what I've got demonstrated here. And if you ever see this on an x-ray, it's, it's indicative or, um, you know, identifies an ACL tear. Um, you can see on the MRI image up top, there's just complete discontinuity or disruption of the ACL fibers. Um, that kind of runs uh, from the shin bone to the the thigh bone there. Um, and then on the bottom MRI picture, you, you can see something called a bone bruise. But when that shin bone shifts forward on the thigh bone, those two bones bang against one another and uh, it can cause a bone bruise pattern. And so when we see that on the MRI, that also um, kind of confirms the ACL injury, but also lets us know that it's a new ACL injury, not an old one. Um, you know, in, for, in regards to treatment, you know, non-operative treatment, and this would be um, for, for some of our lower demand patients who weren't necessarily wishing to return to sport. So I think you can modify your activities. You can kind of hang up the cleats and stop doing coveting and pivoting type activities, and they would be able to get by with bracing and physical therapy. Um, but generally, uh, patients that are wanting to continue with their um, current activity level and, um, and getting back to organized sports or, um, you know, even the weekend warriors, um, typically you're going to want to stabilize the knee. Again, the, the ACL functions to keep the shin bone from shifting forward on the thigh bone and, and protect the cartilage or the, the cap of cartilage on the end of the bone um, that you want to, you know, um, you got to maintain that or you'll get arthritis in the knee, as well as that meniscus, the bumper cartilage between the two bones. And so if the ACL is torn and you're continuing to have instability of the knee, um, it really can end up to, um, to develop arthritis in an earlier age than you otherwise would. So when we talk about surgery, you know, what we're talking about is reconstruction, okay? So a repair would be sewing back the native ligament, but what we're talking about doing is making a new ligament or reconstruction. And so we have to decide what kind of tissue uh, we're going to use and where to get that tissue. And so um, options being an autograft, and that just means we're using your own tissue. And um, you know, this diagram kind of below kind of demonstrates some of the options, whether we get it from your kneecap tendon or your quadriceps tendon or your hamstring tendons. And then um, another option would be an allograft or where we um, use a cadaver tendon um, to make the new ACL. Um, yeah, and so that, that's kind of it on the ACL tears. Uh, I know brief overview, but um, moving on to the medial collateral ligament tear. So that's, that's the ligament on the inside or medial part of the knee. And you can see it attaches on the, um, or on the femur and tibia. And so it can be torn from the femoral side. It can be torn from the tibial side. It can be torn in the midline or, or you can have a combination injury. 
Um, and this is actually the most common ligamentous injury of the knee. And we see this more commonly in our male athletes. And treatment for this is typically non-surgical. And typically uh, these will heal on their own and, and create a, a stable knee once it um, does go through the healing process. So this is most commonly a contact injury with a direct blow to the outside part of the knee as demonstrated in that picture below. Um, but it can be associated with other injuries such as ACL tears or meniscal tears. Um, a lot of times the patients, again, will kind of report the feeling of a pop of a knee, you know, when that ligament tears. They'll have tenderness palpation all along the inside part of the knee and particularly where the tear is, whether it be on the, uh, where it attaches to the thigh bone or the shin bone. Frequently will present with some swelling and bruising along uh, the inside part of the knee as well. And so uh, the way that we kind of determine how to manage an MCL tear um, is really based on this grading system. And, and this will be kind of true for a few other injuries that we'll talk about next. Uh, you don't need to necessarily memorize this, but just, uh, but just appreciate that all MCL tears are not created equal and that some injuries um, are less severe and can have a quicker recovery. Um, and so a low grade injury, such as a grade one injury, you know, uh, would be managed differently than a grade three injury with significant instability to the knee. Um, for MCL tears, again, we're frequently getting x-rays, but more times than not, they are normal. Um, on older injuries that have already healed, sometimes you'll get some calcification, like you can see in that x-ray above. But frequently when we're suspecting an MCL tear, we order an MRI, uh, which allows us to further evaluate the location and the extent of the injury. It's also helpful for evaluating some of those other injuries, um, you know, such as the meniscal tears or the ACL tears. And on that MRI below, you can see that white arrow pointing. That's the, that's the, the black part is the MCL itself, and it's torn off the tibia there, the shin bone. So treatment, like I mentioned before, many times uh, we're able to manage the MCL injuries uh, without surgery. So uh, a period of rest, you know, anti-inflammatory ice to control the swelling, a brace to provide some additional stability and, and physical therapy to strengthen up the other muscles about the knee. Um, for a grade one injury, many times we're able to get athletes back in about a week or so. Um, grade two injuries, it's uh, closer to two to four weeks. Um, and the grade three injuries, you know, uh, four to eight weeks. And not all injuries, though, can be treated um, without surgery. And there's a few in particular that um, are less likely to do well without an operation. And so the distal MCL injuries, the, the tears off the shin bone or the tibia are less, uh, have less healing potential and less likely to do well without surgery. Tears that have part of the ligament traps uh, in the inside part or medial compartment of the knee have less healing potential. And then a displaced distal avulsion or stenter lesion have less healing potential. So sometimes when we uh, get the MRI and we see one of the injuries that's, um, that we know has less healing potential or less likely to do well, um, then we can operate on those patients uh, acutely or quickly, and we're able to just sew down uh, the patient's own MCL back to where it's supposed to live. Um, however, for the injury's been there for some time, um, then we need to bring in extra tissue to stabilize the knee, and that's when we would, again, reconstruct or make a new ligament. Um, third injury that we're talking about is the posterior cruciate ligament, and again, this ligament is uh, helps responsible for keeping the shin bone from shifting backwards on the knee. Uh, and this one's also uh, present with other injuries. So we, we don't see it as frequently in isolation like we would an ACL tear, um, but um, I think important nonetheless. And, and while we're talking about ligaments, I wanted to touch on it. So treatment can either be operative or non-operative and it just kind of depends on the severity of the injury. And it depends if there's other ligaments injured at the same time. Uh, um, something we call a multi-ligament injury, um, you know, that creates a pretty unstable knee, and um, frequently then we're having to reconstruct the PCL, whereas if it happens in isolation, uh, many times we're able to manage it without surgery. Now, the, the tear itself, um, a lot of times it's just due to a direct blow to the front of the knee when the knee's in a flexed position, and, and that diagram there kind of demonstrates what I'm describing, um, but, you know, that can happen in football players or it can happen in car accidents. Um, you know, with this, um, many times we just see patients with a big swollen knee, um, but they don't necessarily have symptoms of their knee giving out or buckling on them. They can have some positive um, provocative signs like a posterior drawer sign or a posterior sag sign on our physical exam. And we'd, um, we get an MRI to um, kind of confirm that injury. And this is just a, a, an example of what a posterior drawer test would be. And you've probably seen a you know, a team doctor on the on the football field doing this um, during the middle of 
of a, a game, but, um, but that's one of the ligaments that they're evaluating for. But this is, again, the posterior drawer sign. This test um, is just kind of showing what we meant by that posterior sag, but it's, again, just a physical exam finding that's kind of indicative of that PCL tear. And just like the MCL, there's different classifications, different severities of the uh, that PCL tear, and um, that can kind of guide our management for the lower grade injuries, like grade one and grade two injuries. Um, many times we can place the patients in braces, anti-inflammatories, a period of rest, get them in some physical therapy, and, and do well without an operation. However, if there's um, more than one ligament injury, or if there's a high-grade isolated injury with an unstable knee, then we'll need to do a PCL reconstruction. And again, that's where we we're gonna take tissue from somewhere else and, and make a new ligament. Um, frequently with a PCL, we'll be using um, the hamstring tendons. So the outside part of the knee, the, the ACL, the PCL, we've talked about the MCL, and, and then on the other side of the knee is the posterior lateral corner. And, and so it's not just the lateral collateral ligament or the fibular collateral ligament, but it also includes the popliteal fibular ligament as well as the popliteus tendon itself. And this, um, you know, this provides side-to-side -side stability of the knee, but also rotational stability of the knee. Um, and <clears throat> again, just showing here the, um, associated with lateral instability, um, but frequently we see this um, not by itself, you know, with, uh, we'll see it in these multi-ligament knee injuries. So with, with a PCL tear or an ACL tear, you know, there's, there's been some studies that shown only 28% of the posterior corner injuries are occurring in isolation. Um, but if it's a missed injury, it really can lead to some poor outcomes and other reconstructions. And so we've, we've come to learn that, you know, if you have an ACL tear, lateral corner tear and only fix the ACL, that can be a significant risk factor for having the ACL reconstruction fail or not work and, and having to have a redo. So it's, it's something that we all need to be paying attention to um, you know, during our initial evaluations of the ligament injury of the knee and, and make sure that um, if it's present, it's identified and treated appropriately. Now, the mechanism of injury for the posterior lateral corner, it can be a direct blow, it can be a hyperextension or twisting injury, it can be contact or non-contact. So it can kind of um, you know, uh, be multiple different ways you can have this injury. And uh, again, you can suspect it on a knee, you know, with a big swollen knee. You know, we know that there's been a ligament injury to the knee. Um, you can do something called a dial test that can help identify some of that rotational instability of the knee. But many times we're relying on an MRI to, to confirm that diagnosis. This picture here just kind of demonstrates what a dial test would be. Flex the knee first at 30 degrees and then at 90 degrees and, and kind of look at any asymmetry or difference between the two sides, which kind of can su suggest an injury to, to those structures. Um, so treatment for the posterior corner, again, like the, uh, the two previous injuries uh, or ligaments that we've talked about, the MCL and the PCL, there's a classification system for this as well. Um, with uh, you know, low-grade injuries or slight strains being uh, adequately managed with non-surgical treatment, you know, again, bracing, rest, um, some physical therapy. But if it uh, occurs concomitantly or with uh, other ligament injuries, the PCL tear or the ACL tear, and many times we're needing to either repair or reconstruct. Again, kind of decisions whether to repair or reconstruct kind of depends on the timing of the surgery. I think if you get to the the injury pretty quickly. Um, there's, uh, there's some role for repairing that ligament, um, but um, many times uh, the results end up uh, being better if we add some tissue or, or perform a reconstruction. And that diagram to the right uh, just shows my current technique of, of how I perform uh, posterior lateral corner reconstructions. Typically, I'm using a, a hamstring for that, but it uh, kind of depends on how many ligament injuries I'm having to repair at the time. You know, once if you're having an ACL tear and a PCL tear and a posterior lateral corner tear, sometimes you're running out of tissue on your own knee, and and um, and just by necessity, we're, we end up having to utilize um, some allograft tissue. Um, so moving on to our next injury, the meniscus, um, and many of us have probably heard of the meniscus. It's uh, a common injury. <clears throat> The meniscus kind of functions as the shock absorbers. And, and so this diagram to the right, you're kind of looking top down on the knee or that's the shin bone. And those two little um, kind of semicircles there are the meniscus. And, and again, they optimize the force transmission through the knee. Um, so it kind of functions as your shocks. They also deepen that surface of the tibia and, and form a secondary restraint. 
um, they essentially help prevent arthritis. They, they make the, the knee function better. And, and when they're torn or taken out, they're, they're not doing their job anymore. And so um, a lot of what we've talked about thus far is trying to keep a stable knee to help protect that structure. Um, so they are a common sports related injury. And we see these injuries in young athletes, but we also see uh, kind of a different subset of patients, you know, in a more degenerative condition, um, kind of a part of the arthritic process. Um, diagnosis can be suspected clinically just with having some joint line tenderness. And um, there's, a, a, again, a provocative test called a McMurray test, which you've kind of seen demonstrated in this diagram to the right. Um, but those, um, you know, those positive physical exam findings would be suggestive of a tear. However, you can't see the, um, the meniscus on an x-ray. And so if, if there's great clinical concern for a meniscal injury, you know, we'd need that MRI to actually see the, see the tear itself. So this is the most common reason for a knee surgery itself. So it's not the most common ligament injury, but it's the most common reason people end up having surgery on their knee, you know, it's for meniscal tear. We know it's a higher risk of having a tear if you have an ACL deficient knee or an unstable knee. Um, overall, the, the tears on the inside part of the knee or the medial part of the knee are more common. However, uh, lateral tears are seen more in acute ACL tears. Um, the patients frequently present with pain, clicking, popping, locking, buckling, giving way of the knee. Uh, on exam, we'll have some swelling in the knee, maybe some decreased range of motion. Um, you know, some of those more provo uh, provocative tests like the McMurray test or athlete compression test can be positive. You know, we get some x-rays to evaluate how much, if any, arthritis is present. But um, again, an MRI is going to be really necessary to identify the tear. You can see this picture on the right. Um, you know, all... Uh, there's different types of meniscus tears and um, you know, the type of tear you have is really going to dictate how we manage that injury. Um, some, the, the blood flow to the meniscus is not all that great. It comes from the peripheral or outside of the knee. And, and so the, the injuries more towards the outside of the meniscus um, have potential to heal. Whereas um, you know, the tears that are just on the inside of the knee, the healing potential is much less. And so, uh, again, kind of depending on what the tear looks like, um, what, you know, the age of the patient, the degree of arthritis, um, the chronicity of the injury, you know, can kind of dictate uh, the preferred approach to how we treat these. Um, and that's essentially just kind of saying the same thing. So the treatment could be anything from non-operative for a degenerative tear um, to surgery. And uh, the surgery could be just taking the torn pieces out, like you see in that bottom, bottom picture, to trying to repair, um, like you see in the top picture. And that's just all, all inside meniscal repair. Um, but that's a vertical longitudinal tear. You know, uh, it's got good blood flow, and that would do, um, you know, has a great potential to do well with a repair. Whereas the, the tear below, um, it's not got good blood flow. It looks more like a parrot beat tear. And, and, and that's one that, you know, is going to be do, do better um, if you take it out. You know, again, the meniscus, uh, its job is help to ensure that we um, have appropriate transmission of the force through the knee joint. And we know from previous studies, studies that, you know, the more meniscus we take out, the less of a role it does or the less helpful it is and the more arthritis you get. So, you know, if possible, we try to um, try to preserve as much of the meniscus as we can, or we try to repair the meniscus in situations where we think there's, you know, some healing potential. Um, although, uh, again, some tears, uh, you know, regardless as how much we'd like to fix them, uh, if we know that they're just not going to do well with the repair, uh, um, then we can move forward with just a, a partial resection or a par partial meniscectomy. So the last topic of tonight is uh, patella dislocation or kneecap dislocation. And so these are injuries I most commonly see in patients in their second to third decades of life. And there's certain risk factors that we see. Um, you know, probably the biggest one is just a previous patellar dislocation. That, that'd be the biggest um, risk factor for um, a, a kneecap dislocation. But also see it in patients that are um, you know, kind of double jointed or ligamentously lax. So if they have stretchier collagen. Um, those patients are a little bit more likely to have, you know, really instability episodes throughout the body, but, uh, but the kneecap as well. And then there's certain other anatomical factors, you know, so patella alta just means that the kneecap's a little higher or uh, up towards the hip than it should be. Trochlear dysplasia just means that the groove and the thigh bone's not quite as deep as it uh, should be, and, and that could uh, lead to some instability, as well as uh, the kneecap kind of being 
tilted to one side. And so um, this is usually a non-contact injury and with the knee foot or with a foot planted uh, in a position and it, uh, the knee just kind of externally rotates the kneecap will come out to the outside or lateral part of the knee. It can also be a direct blow, you know, such as a knee to knee collision or a helmet hitting a, a knee in football. But uh, more frequently in my office, I see, I see patients coming in with these non-contact injuries. And when that kneecap, you know, it, it's completely dislocated or coming off to the side of the knee. And when that goes back to where it's supposed to live, it actually can knock off a piece of cartilage and bone or, or other, another word for that is an osteochondral fracture. And so um, that kind of factors into how we manage these injuries as well. Um, so the medial patellofemoral ligament or the MPFL is what I'm showing here in this picture. And uh, that's the primary restraint to the kneecap in the first 20 degrees of flexion or before it engages in the trochlea or the groove in the thigh bone. So uh, when a kneecap dislocates or come out of place, many times that ligament is torn. And um, that's, uh, I'll, I'll show you here in just a bit, but that's where, um, most more times than not, when I'm having to uh, to surgically manage these, what I'm doing is is reconstructing this ligament here. So on history, again, acute dislocations. A lot of times, it'll be a big swollen knee, like some of the other injuries we've been talking about tonight. Um, tenderness along that inside part of the knee or along that medial patellofemoral ligament. A lot of times, the uh, the kneecap will move more or have uh, increase in passive translation um, when that ligament's torn. And, and you can have something called apprehension or uh, discomfort or uneasiness whenever um, I'm moving the patient's kneecap around. The Q angle is, uh, is it's a measurement between the quadricep tendon and the patellar tendon. And, and, um, and when that's altered, that can be a risk factor for having these instability episodes as, as well as the physical exam finding something called a J sign. Um, and frequently we're getting x-rays on these as well. And, and like I mentioned earlier, there's osteochondral fractures. Um, sometimes we can see those on the x-rays. It also helps me um, evaluate the other kind of risk factors for dislocations, whether it be that trochlear dysplasia or, or the positioning of the kneecap near the patellar height. Um, when I uh, have a patient in the office with patellar dislocation, I, you know, I always get an MRI. You know, I want to um, I want to make sure that we don't have any loose cartilage that's, float, you know, that's um, gotten broken off the kneecap. Um, as well as evaluate the integrity of that medial patellofemoral ligament. Um, and first time dislocations, um, you know, I tell my patients, you kind of get one mulligan. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let one instability episode occur and I'll try to manage those non-surgically with anti-inflammatories, activity modification. We have these things called patellar stabilizing braces, um, some physical therapy. <clears throat> but, um, but after, and that, that's a loose body. So if, as long as it uh, went back to where it was supposed to be and it didn't knock off a piece of cartilage or bone, then you know, I typically try to uh, get by without surgery. Um, but if we're having continued instability, recurrent instability, more than one dislocation, then that's really just not acceptable. We can't allow that kneecap to continue to come out and out and out again, or otherwise um, it'll injure um, the cartilage on that kneecap and, and you'll develop arthritis. Um, so from an operative standpoint, you know, um, First talking about, you know, if there is that osteochondral fracture or a loose piece of cartilage floating in the knee, you know, we've got to make a decision if it's just a small piece or there's no bone attached, sometimes we'll just remove that or, or perform a debridement. If it's a very large piece, then, then uh, we'll try to put it back where it's supposed to go. Um, if you're uh, historically, a lot of times we've performed a MPFL repair and, and sometimes in patients that are still very young and have open growth plates, um, you could consider doing that well, um, but uh, more times than not now, I'm doing uh, something called an MPFL reconstruction. Again, bringing in tissue from somewhere else and making a new ligament. Um, my preferred graft for this would be the gracilis or, or one of the hamstring tendons, although um, some, um, some positions have had good success with an owl graft as well. And then lastly, um, you know, there's another type of procedure that we could do to improve the kneecap tracking or, or the kneecap stability, and it's an osteotomy. Uh, and that just means where we go cut part of the shin bone and we move it over. So it's where the, the, uh, the patellar tendon attaches and we can alter the position of that to improve the, um, the tracking of the kneecap. Um, this diagram here just kind of demonstrates what, um, again, uh, the surgery that I most commonly perform with this injury is, is the MPFL reconstruction, where we um, take, take that hamstring tendon and, and make a new MPFL um, 
which is frequently torn uh, dislocation of that. So in conclusion, uh, careful attention to detail and evaluation of the injuries is important. It is a very complex articulation and a stepwise and methodical exam will help make the diagnosis in most cases. Um, frequently, we'll uh, end up getting an MRI for confirmation of our uh, suspected injuries and, and uh, we'll have an early treatment plan as indicated uh, by our tests and our exams. So with that, uh, any questions? All righty, we have two so far. The first right. one, if someone thinks that they may have an ACL or MCL tear, how important is it for them to be seen right away? Can they wait and get an appointment or do they need to go to a walk-in clinic or the ER? Yeah, you know, I don't think it's necessarily crucial to be evaluated, um, you know, within, um, you know, the same, within an hour or two. Like, um, you know, what's, what's important is that we don't want to have any additional instability episodes of the knee. And so um, when I was growing up playing football, um, we would, you know, if you had ACL tear, you know, it put you back in and lets you finish out the game. Sometimes you can finish out the season. And, and, and now none of us really think that's a very good idea. And so you don't want to um, you don't want to have any for any further instability episodes, but it's not something that necessarily has to you have to go sit in the ER with a bunch of COVID patients. Um, you know, I think it's perfectly fine to have it evaluated the, the next day, but you don't want to put yourself in situations where you may um, you know may may further injure the knee. Um, you know, frequently that first night after the injury, you know, having an ACE wrap or compression, icing the knee, you know, taking some ibuprofens can, can make the night um, a little bit more tolerable. All righty, and then one more question. What type of ACL bridge construction do you typically perform? Uh, um, yeah, that's true. Uh, good question um, with uh, not a so straight, not, not a very really straightforward answer because um, I really kind of just tailor it to the patient. And um, yeah, I do ACL reconstructions on patients, um, you know, um, through all walks of life, really. You know, I did a revision ACL reconstruction on um, a lady yesterday that's um, still kind of a weekend warrior type. Um, and I've done ACL reconstruction on a nine year old before. And so, um, there's just things that we have to factor in, um, you know, when we're skeletally immature or when we're um, still growing, we have to worry about those growth plates. And so um, for those patients, we have to do something, a soft tissue graft. Um, and uh, that would be like the hamstring graft. And so that's my, my preferred choice for my skeletally, uh, preferred graft choice for skeletally immature. Um, for me, when I'm having patients that are still playing organized sports, um, you know, so high school, college age kids, and I kind of uh, lean more towards that, that patellar tendon, uh, the bone tendon bone. Um, you have a, a piece of bone from the kneecap, a piece of bone from the shin bone and the kneecap tendon. And um, yeah, I think you get really, really strong initial fixation. You know, you just get bone with a screw in there and, um, you know, it's um, feel really good about that graft. It's been, uh, it's kind of the gold standard. It's been around for, um, for a long, long time, and it's had an excellent track record. And I, I think if you polled a lot of the doctors taking care of NFL athletes and IM athletes, you know, uh, for many of them, I, I think that's their preferred graft as well for, for those age patients. We do know for some more recent studies that, that cadaver tissue um, or the allograft has got a higher failure rate in, in patients, you know, younger patients or patients uh, younger than 20. And so, um, for those patients, I, I don't really even offer an allograft um, just because I, I know that, um, you know, that that study to be true. Um, but the downside of the kneecap graft or uh, tendon or the bone cell or tendon uh, bone graft, it, it can have a slightly higher risk of some pain in the front part of the knee or anterior knee pain. And, um, and in my clinic, I frequently see, you know, patients in their 30s or 40s or 50s who are starting to have some pain with climbing stairs or doing squats or lunges or um, you know, so I kind of start to worry about the patellofemoral joint in those patients, and um, and sometimes I'm concerned adding a patellar tendon graft um, may increase the risk of them having some pain in the front part of their knee. And so any patient that have, comes in with a history of that, or or if they're getting to be in those age um, brackets, I'll um, kind of re recommend the hamstring autograft their own tissue. And then if I have an older patient, kind of weekend warrior type, you know, in their 40s or 50s, that's really wanting to minimize their time away from work. 
um, minimize the amount of surgery that they're having to undergo, then um, for me, and um, that those are kind of the times that I would uh, consider doing the allograft tissue. Um, so uh, it takes a little bit longer for the grafting corporate, but if we're not uh, having a hard deadline or a season that we're trying to get back to, um, I do think it can be a little bit less painful. Um, again, there's a little bit less surgery from the graft harvest and, um, and may allow patient to get back to work, you know, a bit sooner. All righty, and I think we have one more question. Let me read through this real quick. Okay, for an MPFL tear, what physical exam testing is most sensitive slash specific? You know, um, I think probably back to that um, that first slide that I said, the most important thing um, is, is the, really the history. And so I, I think more than a physical exam is um, is really listening to the patient because um, a lot of times when they're coming in, they'll, they'll kind of tell me what's happening. And I'll say, oh, well, they've, you know, they've got a kneecap dislocation or they've had a patellar dislocation. Um, you know, so and I think in knowing the out, we, you can kind of um, you know, assume or, or be correct in the um, knowing that the MPFL has been either stretched out or torn. But um, but I guess to answer the question, um, I, I think the tenderness over the ligament um, is, is going to be the most, and, and so that's right along where it runs from the attachment to the kneecap to the attachment of, of the thigh bone to the femur. Um, so tenderness there is really going to be indicative of an injury. And then again, that increased translation. And so if you, if you kind of grab the kneecap and try to move it out to the side, and it feels like it's moving more than it should or more than two quadrants over, then um, again, that can be indicative of that tear. All righty, thank you so much, Dr. Biggers. And thank you everyone for attending our webinar on common knee injuries in athletes. In a few short days, we will have this uploaded to our YouTube channel and to our website if you'd like to share with your friends or rewatch the presentation. Everyone, y'all have a good evening.